Okay. And we are going live right now. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Mike Huberty from Broadgem. I'm the Artist Services Manager at Broadgem.com. And I'm excited tonight because we're going to go live. This is our first Facebook Live that we've actually done where we can take people's questions and stuff. We've done Facebook Lives from Broadgem events, different ones uh, in New York and L.A. and Austin during South By. But now this is our first time where we can actually do one and have a conversation with everybody. So this is a preview of something that we often do with uh, our providers and pro reviewers and different professionals that we work with at Broadgem. We often have little webinars, and most of the time we do them in like a – a webinar type setting, but people have said try the Facebook Live, so now that's what we're going to do here. Feel free to put your comments and questions, and we can get to them when we can. Uh, but otherwise, oh, and if you hear a snow plow in the background, that's because I'm in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, and we had five inches of snow here today, and it's still going, and it's the, it is the middle of April. So we are over halfway through April, and we have five inches of snow on the ground today. Uh, and so if you hear a snow plow, don't worry. Um, it's, it's, it's just par for the course here in the Midwest. <laughs> and so today we want to welcome a longtime provider of Broadjam. Now, she's selected dozens, if not hundreds of hundreds, people, hundreds I think, hundreds of Broadjam artists and played them on her show. And it's Women of Substance. It was an online radio station now. It's an iTunes new and noteworthy podcast. Um, and we got to bring on Bree Noble. And we're going to talk to Brie a little bit about Women of Substance, what got her into music, what she looks for when she tries to select a song. And she's got a really cool event coming up called the Profitable Musician Summit. And you're going to want to hear all about that, too. So without further ado, here's Brie. Brie, how are you doing today? I am doing so well. And you're going to hate me because it's like 65 degrees here in California. So mm, okay. sorry. <laughs> well, it's, it should be at least in the 50s. Uh, in April today or, you know, by the middle of the day or whatever. Um, but you know what? We can live. Yeah. We can live yeah. because we, we have three good months here and, um, we, you know, we'll take them. That's all, that's what we got. So, so okay, you are in California. Are you, are you a Californian? I am a Californian. And I do have to say it did snow on Monday, though. I live in the mountains. So I'm actually a, a forever Californian. But for the past six years, I've lived up in the mountains near Yosemite, which has been a really cool experience before that, like 18 years in Southern California, and before that, Northern California native. So, yeah, total Californian. All right, fantastic. Well, that's what we kind of hear about. So, number one, let's talk a little bit about the history of Women of Substance, how long you've been involved with it, and uh, why you got into it in the first place. Well, we started in November 2007, so it's been over 10 years, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, when I started it, I was a touring musician. And I just saw that there were so many f amazing female artists that weren't getting the kind of airplay or recognition that I thought they deserved. I was meeting them on the road. I was meeting them online as I was networking as a musician. And I just thought, this is not right. Plus, I had kind of started this little radio station on Live 365 a while back when I was working in the corporate world just to listen to music that I liked. And I had been picking a bunch of independent artists I'd met along the way on mp3.com and stuff. And so I just, that's when I named it, like back in 2001. And then I kind of like let it to the side for a while. And then I just started building it as a platform in 2007 and pretty quickly started choosing independent artists to put on the station on top of what I already had and liked. And Broadjam, like, I probably reached out to you guys pretty early. I and mean, we've probably been working with Broadjam for at least eight years, for sure. Oh, wow. That, that I mean, number one, eight years. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome that we've been able to have a, a relationship for that long. Um, but number two, uh, just the fact that anybody in the music business has been doing something for this <laughs> long of a time, like, is always, is always amazing. Because as you know... Things tend to, especially when it comes to internet music things, things tend to start and, and stop quickly. So, you know, women of substance, um, why would you, you know, what do you think you can attribute some of your longevity to and your desire to keep going and everything like that over all this time? Um, why do you think you have persevered? I think that I just have such a passion to help female artists. I think part of it is just being one myself. 
and just kind of transferring that desire that I had as a musician to get my music out there, then as I didn't want to tour anymore, I kind of transferred that into how can I help other artists that do want to do what I was doing and do want to get their music out there. And, you know, I couldn't be doing it this long if I didn't really believe in the cause behind it. And, you know, I, although I think that the, the industry has made strides as far as more women, you know, we're still seeing so many markers that it's not there yet. Oh. So I just think there's so much further that we have to go. And there's so many ways that I can highlight that, you know, doing everything from having a series of shows on Me Too, doing things like women uh, music with a conscience, you know, trying to to bring out some important issues in the world, you know, so there's a lot of ways that I think that women can contribute. And so just being able to be innovative and fun with that and um, finding new ways to promote female artists, I think that's why I'm still doing it. And the people are amazing. Like, I love everything, every artist that I've met through Women of Substance has been fantastic. So you, you mentioned before, you're like, oh, I, I started as an artist. You know, you, one of the reasons you care is that you're an artist yourself. So... Uh, what, how did you, you know, start going? What was your first exposure? And are, I mean, are you a guitar player? Are you a piano player? Are you a folk artist? Are you a metal chick? What, <laughs> what are you into, uh, Bree? So we can kind of get a little bit of your history and where you're coming from. I just love the idea of me as a metal chick. Definitely hey. not. <laughs> I could try it. Uh, no, I'm more of a, um, I'm classically trained, but I've always, my heart has been in being a singer songwriter I'm a keyboard player, songwriter. Um, I focus on inspirational music, some Christian, some more crossover. And that's kind of what I was doing as a musician is um, I was combining this, the songs and the singing with my own story and kind of a speaking experience. So like a whole program that I did a lot of places. Um, I had a few CDs that I recorded and it's not like it was a national artist, but I performed all over California. I definitely kept very busy, um, performed in Oregon and some other states. So it's not like I, you know, skyrocketed to fame or anything, but I was a working musician making a living. And that's, I think that's all we can ask as musicians. And it's really the only thing that I wanted by the time I got there. I didn't necessarily want to be famous or anything. Well, that's, uh, that, that's pretty good because, you see, I got into music because I wanted to be famous. So, you know, really. And I, well, I'm you, sure I did in my 20s, but I got over it. <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to play in front of a million people. I wanted to get a song in front of, a, you know, uh, uh, you know, you started and I wanted to be, you know, David Lee Roth or uh, Alice Cooper probably is who I really wanted to be. <laughs> um, but but the idea, but that's the thing you want to get in. And, and this is something that I think gets to the heart of a, lo a reason a lot of broad jam artists, um, artists that you work with the women of substance, people who, um, are going to be going to the profitable musician summit, uh, in May. I think, I think a lot of what gets that it's not just, we want to be famous. It's just that you want to create something that gets attention. You want to get your song out there. You know, it. the thing is when you think about being famous, does anybody really want to be, um, you know, somebody that that's mobbed in public, like Justin Timberlake. You, you want to be somebody who can't go uh, to Target uh, to buy something? Probably not. But the only thing that I would take about being famous is that I I don't want to wait in line at restaurants anymore. Like if I could mm. walk right if I could walk right in and I get a table. Well, now we're talking about something like that's perfectly fine. I will take that level of fame. Um, but I, but I think the thing that people really want is they want their song to be in front of as many people as possible. And I know that's something that we consider, you know, for Broad Jam. Um, and, and so that's something that we really want to work on ourselves. So, you know, how when you work with women of substance, like and you're and you're picking songs and things like that, um, where does your maybe taste or where does some of your um, when you're picking songs for your podcast, what are you looking for? Is it sound quality? Is it sound quality? Is it genre? Uh, I think I think that might help people uh, to know like what level of quality they need to get on something like the Women of Substance podcast. Yeah, well, I mean, our tagline is playing quality music by female artists in all genres. So, 
yes, we say we accept all genres. There have been a few out there that I'm like, no, it just can't do this genre. It's just too weird. But pretty much I try to, and I, you know, even if I don't love a certain genre, I try to look at it like, what is the best music in this genre going to be? Like, what would be a representation of that best music, regardless of my taste? And I try very hard to do that. But, um, you know, we've we've been an online radio station. We were that for 10 years. In 2014, we moved to a podcast, and we had both for a while, and now we're a podcast because we've just doubled down on it because it's grown so fast. So I still think of us as a radio quality show. Like, I want to have the music that we accept really needs to be radio quality or just below or it can be a live recording if it's recorded really well there's not a lot of background noise and it's just done really well it's it doesn't sound fuzzy or you know there's there's some ambiance to it but mostly what we want is radio quality music um it need the instrumentals like i can't even i there's it's so important that your instrumentals sound good and they don't sound, you know, canned or like drum machined or the things that I see are like drum beats that are uneven. They don't sound like their studio quality. Um, just make sure that, you know, you're, it's well mixed and mastering have to be mastered for what we do. But mastering always makes it sound better. Okay. But as far as genre, like we play and we play everything. We don't play a ton of rap. Like I have to think about our listeners. But if it's really good, like empowering female rap, we absolutely play it. And, you know, hard rock. Yeah, I'll take the best of that genre. Even metal, like the best of that genre. Um, but mostly we play singer, songwriter, folk, pop, rock, um, indie, that kind of stuff. Okay. Country, Americana. So what do you think? No, no. What would you might think that um, when you're listening to submissions and you, I mean, and you must hear hundreds of different artists every single month. I mean, I know that I do. Um, My lord, yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, through a variety of sources, we're all listening to a ton of music all the time. Now, what would you say are the three biggest things that makes you not? I mean, you, you already went into a little bit, but the three biggest things that if you hear it. You're like, oh, this is a good song, but I, I, I can't use it. Like, what, what are the three that, that might always knock it out? And you're like, man, I wish it didn't, but it, it does. Um, I'd say the arrangement. Well, number one would probably be the vocals. Like, if the vocals are not strong, if they're, if they're wavery, if they just aren't in tune, you know, a little pitchy dog, like, no, I can't, I can't do that because I'm a vocalist. <laughs> so that will really bother me, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, if if the arrangement is either sounds amateurish or it's just feels like it's kind of all over the place and not together, that one bothers me too. Um, and like one that I don't even know if I have this anywhere on broad jam, but it's never been an issue on broad jam, but we need clean lyrics. Like I cannot have the F word all over. It's just, it's not the kind of audience that we attract. So that's a big one. It's literally never been a problem at Broad Jam, but on other places that I get music, I'm constantly saying like, "No, we need clean lyrics." Well, that's a, no, that's a, that's a really interesting point I think you're making here, and, and one of the reasons because of the clean lyrics. That's something even on iTunes, you know that that will move your uh, podcast into a different area. Yeah, but like we don't have an E, on, you know, for explicit lyrics on our podcast. And if we even have one episode without clean lyrics, we don't have to put the E on there. And it's going to make some people think twice about listening. So that's the reason. Well, you know, and that's, that's awesome because that's what we were just talking about. We were talking about you want to get your music in front of as many people as possible. You want to get your podcast in front of as many people as possible. And we... As people that work in the industry, me at Broadrim, you at Women of Substance, we want to get your music, the, the artists that we work with and help promote, and try, we want to get your music for as many people as possible. And so sometimes that means um, you have to judge the, uh, the level of artistic expression with the venue it's going to be presented in. It, it's right. it's kind of like if you, you know, when you're playing at a bar and it's one o'clock in the morning, and everybody's obviously, you know, over 21 and probably hammered. And you make some kind of, you can make a vulgar joke or whatever, because it's kind of expected. 
Now, when you're doing a show at the high school in a couple of weeks, because you know, <laughs> as part of their cultural enrichment course, and you make that same joke, you are arrested. <laughs> So, in, and this is an, always an important thing we try to teach Broad Jam artists is that the venue, I mean, you do your best to create what will be the best for the venue in that not just not just the venue that you're going to be playing in, but the venue that you will be, uh, your music will be played in. You know, yeah, and I wanted to say something else about that too because, please do, please do. Uh, you know, our name is Women of Substance, right? And there's not a lot of places to put, like, describe what we are. But if you go to our website, you'll see that, like, part of our mission as far as, like, high quality and stuff, but then it's, like, the lyrics, we were really looking for, like, deep emotional lyrics that are telling a story or are empowering or, you know, substantive. Like, that's where that came from. And so I do sometimes have to say to people like, this song is catchy and it's a good song, but we don't, we're not really looking for songs about partying or sex. Like if you can talk about those things in a really artistic way and that's a little more emotional, then I'm interested. But if it's just like really blatantly about partying or sex or whatever, I'm just not really interested in that. Well, and there are plenty of venues Right. Your songs about like they don't. I mean, it's not like oh no, no one's like, ever going to hear not, my song. Something's wrong with your song. It's just not right for my venue. And and that's a. I think that's a great point you're making there too, Bree. Because this is something that we encourage um, when you know broad gym artists are sending something in. Um, you know, we talk about this when we when we advertise the listing for Women of Substance. You get it, and then you list the artists that you have played before and give you a couple of, give a couple of more mainstream artists that you've played before. And I think that people will realize that if, if my songs are in that vein, then it's more like it. So what, what are a few of the artists I know that you list, list in your, uh, in your listing, people like Sarah Bariles, right. And Colby Calais and. Right. So in the, in the old days when we were a radio station, we did play independent artists and uh, regular artists side by side. Now that we're a podcast, we're completely independent only. So we can't really list those anymore. But I mean, the kind of things I'm looking for and what I would have put you right next to is Ingrid Michelson, Sarah Bareilles, Sarah McLaughlin. Um, and then, you know, and people in, in other genre, you know, Paramore, just, you know, the really Taylor Swift and and then maybe like more indie kind of folk and stuff that, um, you know, it's not coming to mind right now. But like if you want to send your music in to anyone, go listen to it first. Just go spend 20 minutes listening to one of our podcasts and you'll know if your music fits and then you won't waste your money and your time. And, you know, I didn't even mention this, but, like, one of the other things we get is, like, clearly, like, women of substance, right, you would think, but people just sometimes blanket submit, and they don't pay attention, and we get male artists submitting. And so then, you know, I feel bad because you're wasting your money, but you need to pay attention to that. Well, you know, I, I don't feel bad because that person <laughs> should have read the email. Right, like, right. You know, and, and I'm so, so the drummer in my band, uh, my band's called Sunspot, and the drummer of my band's a, a, a woman, Wendy Lynn, and um, and so we've played different female empowering events across the country and stuff like that. But that's it comes, you know, it comes with the, it, it's not things where it says they want a female voice or a female, you know, it comes to things like, hey, if there's any if there's any ladies in the band, you know, go ahead and send it in, and like right. I wouldn't send in one of our songs where I'm singing on it and be like, Hey, check out this all girl band. Cause then people would be like, that's what, like, that's some girl you got there. Yeah. I try to make it clear. It's female artists or female fronted bands. So, you know, I do want to hear a female vocalist Absolutely. is what I'm looking for. Or if it's an instrumental, which we do accept, then, you know, I'd like to make sure that you're the instrumentalist. You're the featured instrumentalist. And we absolutely do play instrumentals. And, and well, instrumentals, um, Oh, I'm, well, I've made a joke about Alice Cooper earlier. I was talking about Alice Cooper. But he just, I mean, he just came through, and his lead guitarist is a, a wicked, I mean, a, a, a wicked woman. Like, she is a, a smoking guitar player, and it's not even, it used to have Orianti, and now it's, I, I can't remember her name, somebody new, but um, uh, Alice's new guitar player is a, a really great woman. So Awesome. And so it, it's uh, just saying, it's not just men who can shred. So, ladies, we want to see you on 6th Street. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, all right. So, you know, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, where you're coming from, things about the podcast. If you guys at home are interested, uh, you can feel free to ask questions about that. Um, and any questions you might have, if you're interested in like how a broad jam provider listens to music and thing, but we should also talk about the profitable musician summit, um, that if you guys are interested in, you'll be able to participate, uh, coming up and this is in May, right? So let's get the skinny on how people can be profitable musicians. Yes. So it's coming up very soon. I'm super excited about it. Um, we have 39 experts that we brought in to talk on 32 different streams of income. So my whole goal with this is I want musicians to make money because I want them to keep making music. And the only way you're going to keep making music is either you get independently wealthy or you're actually making money doing your music and doing what you love. So I wanted to provide you with some like step by step action plans on how you can, you know, add all these different income streams. Cause I do think that nowadays as musicians, we need to have a lot of different income streams to make a living. You know, whether it's we, you know, we perform live, we perform at these different, different kinds of venues, we tour, then we have, you know, our streaming income, uh, streaming income from, you know, our Spotify and stuff like that. We, um, you know, we maybe we teach lessons or we have a home studio and we record sessions in our home studio. You know, there's so many ways to make money. And I just wanted to make sure to just open those up to everybody and let them know how they can do them by bringing in experts that, you know, musicians or people in the industry that are doing it and have made money at it and are making money at it and can really break it down. So that was the goal. Um, it starts May 1st. It's May 1st to May 10th. It's an online conference, basically. So instead of having to fly off somewhere and pay for your hotel and all that, you can come to this online conference. We have four to five speakers a day. The ticket is free. So I, like, I don't see any barriers here. Like, Why wouldn't everyone want to sign up? Because you can do it from your either your own home or on the go with mobile. It's totally free, and you get to enjoy all these great interviews with these speakers um, Wait, how does and an online learn a lot. Real quick, though, how does I mean, right? How does how would an online conference work? Would it be is it like a webinar format, like we're talking about? Is it going to be pre-recorded or? Um, it's pre-recorded, so I've already recorded them all, um, cool. and then we just we make them available every day. So every day we have four to five of them that are available. Uh, for that day, they're available for 48 hours for free. If you're a free ticket holder, we do have an option if you want to have lifetime access to all of them. Um, and then, you know, we'll have a, a Facebook group that goes along with it. So we can all have discussion about the different speakers. We can have, you know, the speakers pop in there and answer questions. And um, and it's being put on not just by me, but I'm kind of the, the front person. I d- did all the interviews and everything. But uh, my friend Steve Pal Freeman, he put on the Music Launch Summit back in 2016. It was a huge, amazing, successful summit, if any of you went to it. And so he's the dual brains behind this to make sure that it's going to be a really ma- amazing event. So if you know what he put on back then, it's going to be that caliber and better. Okay. Well, you know what I'm interested in? If you did uh, a lot of the interviews and stuff. I did all of them. You know, all the, you know, all the interviews and all the content, then... I'm interested in, Bree, so what is some of your favorite uh, content and what are some of your favorite interviews that you did uh, while you were doing it that you like? You can't wait for people to see because you think it's going to be something uh, that's going to be really valuable? Oh, man, there's so many. Um, there was, I did an interview with Jeff Celentano about um, corporate events, which was really eye-opening to me. I didn't understand how the world of talent buying and corporate events works and how you get in on that scene. Um, and he's like busy almost all year round doing corporate events and they make really good money at it. So that was a really good one. Um, my friend Roberto Candelaria came in and talked about sponsorships, which is something that I don't hear talked a lot about with musicians, how we can get sponsorships for everything that we do. And he just really uncovers like all the things that you might not have thought of that you could get sponsored and, you know, how you go about finding these decision makers at corporations that are actually have money to spend on sponsorships. So that's that's a really good one. Um, 
you know, we, we cover everything from like, I think a lot of musicians have home studio equipment, Mm -hmm. but they haven't thought about how they can use that other than recording their own music to make money. And, you know, there's places like air gigs and, and other places like that online where you can get session work. And so I have someone talking about that, people talking about how you can kind of run your own home studio and bring other artists in. Um, another great one if for all of you that have students, maybe you're teaching, you know, voice or piano or guitar or something locally, we have someone talking about being able to do that virtually and how that works and how you can expand your student base that way. Um, and, and what's cool is if you're, if you're teaching musicians that are on tour, then you can learn how you can continue helping them and giving lessons while they're gone. So that's just a few that are coming to mind, but there's just, there's, I mean, we probably have, uh, eight, eight or nine that are specifically about like live performing. Cause I think that's really important. And then we have everything from, you know, learning about making more money on Spotify and getting on Spotify playlists to, you know, like I said, all the stuff that's about teaching students and home studio. Um, and then a lot of direct to fan, you know, two people talking about crowdfunding. We have the fantastic Ariel Hyatt, who wrote the book Crowd Start, talking about crowdfunding. And then an artist that she's worked with that's done several successful crowdfunding campaigns. So there's just like we try to run the gamut of everything that we could come up with that a musician can make money from. We even have a whole session about busking, which I think is fabulous. You don't hear a lot of people talking about it, but we were talking about physical local busking busking and then online busking oh yeah there's that whole site like street jelly or whatever like street yes jelly it is that we have the people from street jelly and then we have an artist that uses street jelly talking about it yeah and you know there's uh there's uh, man there's some other kind of youtube-ish kind of thing that people are using for for busking i know like it's got you in the name and i can't think of it right now but mm. there are all these different places and it, you know it's funny you bring up busking because like it's a you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's a lot of work, or it's hard, or it's embarrassing, or all these different things. But, you know, if you if you busk in the right place, you know, you can you can generate a lot of excitement for a show later that night. You can make a few bucks. I mean, think about the people who busk at the Santa Monica Pier. Mm, oh my gosh, I know. Right, those people are roll like not not rolling in it, you know, but they they're doing. Oh, it, they're making more money than the guy playing the punk rock dive that night down the street. For sure. And and so that's that's a cool thing you're bringing that up. And then you, you know some of the speakers you have. I know we've had people been on our webinars before. I saw a picture of Fett in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know Fett always comes with Nancy and, mm-hmm. they, and Nancy Moran. Um, and they always have a lot of great advice for everybody. Uh, she's a wonderful songwriter. Fett's a wonderful recording engineer with a, a ton of great tips for everybody. And so besides busking and, uh, you know, in sponsorships, is there anything that you'd say that um, while you were working on the Prof Musician Summit that, that surprised you the most? Is there anything in particular that you're like, you know what? I never thought of that before. That's a, like, that's a good one. I can't wait to evangelize that. Now, you don't have to spoil it. But what do you what do you think might be the the thing that surprised you the most? Man, I don't know because I had thought through this stuff so much in advance in order to to like invite the speaker. So uh, there wasn't like any income stream that surprised me. But I think, like I said earlier, like the the corporate um, the corporate gigs and the um, we also had Tiamo De Vittori talking about keynote concerts, and that's one. I just feel like there's such an opening for musicians to be more than just a singer songwriter, but be a presenter of a program where you can command a lot more money. And so a lot of the things that he talked about, just it's, it's surprising and it will be surprising to the people watching how much money you can actually make as a musician. If you just, if you make yourself a keynote concert presenter, instead of just, a musician, like just changing that mindset of like, I'm presenting a program versus I'm just the, the music. Well, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a great way to put it too. That's a, uh, that's a cool idea. Cause when you think about it, um, a lot of times when, you know, people are uh, performing or whatever, 
it's you know they're thinking well i play at happy hours and i'm the background music before dinner or i you know i'm that kind of thing but i could be the you know as a musician you're thinking maybe i want to be the main event you know and maybe maybe i could be the the main event in presenting uh context around the songs stories around the songs um things that can you know that that bring more excitement to the music and bring more context um and, and, and turn it into a presentation. Well, that's a, that's a really fun idea. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of how I built my career when I was a musician, but I wasn't as plugged in as Tiamo is. So he gives you so many great pieces of advice on how to get plugged in with these corporations. I was doing more private events and parties and, and you know, churches and community organizations. And But I do remember the first time that I ever did a presentation like this where I was talking and singing and telling my stories and all that. And I did it for a fundraiser, and I was a paid a paid 1000 bucks. And I was like, I'm into this. Yeah. Let's keep right? doing this. That's, that's like 1000 bucks. That's real money. Yeah, it's real money. And they put me up overnight, me and my entire family. You know, it was it was awesome. Right, that's that's how the other half lives, right? You know, <laughs> that's how the other half lives. Okay, so when you talk about being a musician, being a performer, what's the first song you ever learned how to play? Oh my lord, I, the play! I don't know, I can't remember. But the first song that I ever used to sing, and this is going to date me so badly, don't worry. but I was three. Like my favorite thing to sing was. Hey, did you happen to see the most beautiful girl in the world? And I would sing that like ah, everywhere, yes. like a grocery store. I would like get my pretend mic. You know, every singer has these stories about how you think everything like a hairbrush is a mic and you're singing. And so I would sing that everywhere. That's the first song I remember singing. All right. That, well, that's Brie as a, as a young, as a developing performer. Yes. At three. That was, you know, that's. That's how you started out. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so, you know, as you got, what made you decide to move from the you know performing aspect to wanting to be part of more of uh, helping artists, pr helping promote music, finding quality stuff to share with people, and now really by working hard on things like the Pro Musician Summit, uh, what you're doing is you're you know you're becoming an educator in your own right. So how did that kind of transition work for you as you moved uh, from, from, from thing to thing? Because, you know, what I always have a problem with, like, I like helping other artists. I like working at Broad Gym and doing stuff. Um, but still, like, when I see, even when I help this happen, when I see, like, somebody get a sweet, you know, like, TV deal or whatever, I'm like, I'm, I'm still kind of like, I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> so so how, do you, how did you move on that transition? You know, I think I had I had reached what I wanted to with with my singing career. You know, I'd always felt this drive to do it and I had 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 a good run, you know. And then I my kids were in elementary school and I started hearing, "Hey, what you and you're going on tour for 2 weeks at Christmas time and you're missing my gymnastics recital and you're missing building gingerbread houses and all the things." So I was like, I think I just I need to stay home for a while and stop touring. And then I ended up moving to the mountains. So unless I drive an hour away, there's really not many places to perform here. So it kind of worked out with perfect timing. So I ended up just saying, you know, I'm going to start working with some of the artists. And it was it was a natural transition because there's so many amazing artists with women of substance. I mean, I've worked with thousands of them over the years. And I just see so much great talent, but a lot of them didn't have the skills to market themselves. They didn't, you know, know how to book themselves and start making money. And so they were just kind of stuck and they were kind of waiting around for somebody, a record label or a manager to just like swoop them up and, and say, okay, now your career is starting. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you can start your career right now. Because if I did it, and I'm just this one person, this singer-songwriter person that didn't have any experience and didn't have any connections, like if I can do that, then you guys can. So I just started, you know, my podcast, The Female Entrepreneur Musician, was to help with that. And then soon after that, I opened the Female Musician Academy. And, you know, you're seeing a trend here. It's all female, right? Because that's the artist I'd been working with for so many years. 
And, you know, so it was just a natural progression and building that community and everybody helping each other and building each other up. And so it just, it made sense. It was something I could do from home. And, you know, my kids were starting to all be in school. So I had the time. And um, just this, this summit is like something I've been thinking about for a while. And I'm excited that it's finally happening. Well, I, you know, I think that's really powerful. So one of the things you're saying, you're saying, oh, yeah, that's very, you know, female-oriented. Um, but, you know, I, I'm friends with Madeline Sklar, who used to run the Go Girls music. And, mm-hmm. you know, we used to play at Go Girls events in Texas and, and it, all, you know, in different cities and everything. And, um, like, we'd even, like, like, run the back line at some of the events and be in it all there. And, and the thing is, you think that, well, there's so many female singer-songwriters, whatever, they don't, what help do they need? But, you know, I tell you, Music and this comes from a perspective at least in in the, the rock area is is very much a boys club. It's mm-hmm. very you know it's there's it's very much a you know it's a locker room mentality in a lot of ways. And so, I do think one of the powerful things uh, about the Go Girls was that um, it provided a an outlet for women to talk to each other to share. It didn't matter if you were in rock or you were a rapper or you were a singer songwriter, everything like that. It it, it you know it provided something for you. Um, you know, a place where you didn't have to be, you know, surrounded by a bunch of sweaty dudes who were high on testosterone. And I think that was a, a, you know, a powerful thing. And so I think things like, uh, you talk about the female musicians Academy and empowering, uh, female musicians, you know, I, I still think there's a lot of room for that in music, even though we've seen so many successful female artists, uh, it is important that everybody, you know, feels comfortable and and can express themselves in a space where they can develop themselves fully. Yeah, I totally agree. That's what I wanted to create. And that was something that really helped me as I was learning as a musician. I found a group like that, a group of like 10 women, and that made all the difference for me. And so I just wanted to create something like that and share the wealth because I knew that it, it helped me so much and having that support. So yeah, that was, that was always the plan. And, you know, we have people in our community from age like 16 to, you know, over 70. So it's a great mentoring opportunity for the, the older people to help out the younger people and the younger people to inspire the older people. And I just I truly believe that nowadays more than ever, there's a place for every musician, no matter what your age is, no matter what your genre and your background and all that. So that's one cool thing about it too, is I've brought together all these, you know, people from so many different walks of life. And I I like how you said that there. And this is something we talk about at Broad Jam all the time. There's a place for all different kinds of every kind of genre, every kind of person, every kind of music. You know, it's funny. Who would have thought it? There is a place for acapella music. There's super successful. There's a huge place for us. My daughter's obsessed with pentatonics. When I was a kid, you know, a young, a young, a young man listening to music, I'd be like, "Yeah, your acapella band is sweet." You know, it just wasn't my thing, right? I, okay, I get it. But they're super successful. They're doing super. So, you know, there's a place for every single type of music. Um, you know, as somebody who has played a lot, performed a lot, now been on sides of music where you're not performing, you're helping artists, you're educating, you've seen thousands of different artists. Well, you know. Let's say that I'm, don't even pick an age, let's, any kind of age out there, but let's say I'm an artist, I, I just finished my first album. I have a collection of songs or even an EP of songs that I think are really great. Um, what would be the next thing I should do? Like, okay, I, and this is where I think everybody gets stuck. Like, oh, I made a great album. Uh, and what would be the next thing that you would you'd say that maybe should do? Well, I mean, unfortunately, the thing that you should have done before you made the album was to start building your fan base. And that's and, you know, I talk about this in kind of like the five stages of your music career. And most people come to me and I say you shouldn't have made your album until stage three. And they're like, yeah, I already did that. You know, most of people do. They make their album first. And I get that. But it would have been better if you could have built your fan base, grassroots, performing, you know, doing live video, all that, build your fan base and then make your album because you've got people there ready and waiting to buy it instead of having a garage full of boxes, which we've all been there, right? We've all had a garage full of boxes of CDs. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. that okay. we couldn't and sell. Being no, being a being a musician will make you a hoarder. It will make you an involuntary hoarder. <laughs> So, so if you haven't yeah. done that, if you haven't done that, then you need to start right away. You need to go grassroots. And when I say grassroots, I mean like reach out to people individually. Just like Ariel Hyatt says about crowdfunding, like you can't just think that you're going to blanket email or blanket social media and people are going to step up. Like you need to reach out to them and offer a hand out to them, whether it's on Facebook Messenger or email or physically in person and say, hey, would you be willing to come on this journey with me and help me and su help me support my music? Would you be willing to share it with your friends? That is the way that you start building if you've got no fan base. And, they, you know, that's uh, an awesome point. You were talking about the individual. That's that's a great way to start is individually introducing yourself. I remember back, you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago, as we as we go back in time, uh, we used to get... Uh, you get a you get a spindle of CDs um, for about four hundred dollars for a thousand of them, and so we'd make up demo CDs with like three songs on it, and put and, and we'd stuff them in the envelopes and put them in put the flyers for the show the next night. Drive to the town, uh, hang out at the club you're playing at the night before, and then hand out as many CDs as people would take them and say, "Listen to the CD, come back tomorrow. Listen to the CD, come back tomorrow. Please, for the love of God, come back mm. tomorrow." And and you do that, and that was the way. Like that was that personal way. You end up like that. End up building a scene in different markets for our band was making that personal connection in the first place, and it required prep and time and thought. Um, yep. And, and yep. Also, and you have to make sure that you don't waste that too by, by making sure that you stay connected with those people. Whether it's an email list, whether it's a a you know, you're getting them on your texting list, you're getting them on your Facebook messenger list, you're at least getting them on your social media, like, you put all that work into it, make sure that you can then communicate with them again the next week, even if you're not in their town. And that's, a, that's exactly right. That's, a, that's an awesome point. I, I like what you're saying there, Brie, because one of the things you're talking about there is about building a community around your music. And I think a lot of artists are afraid that they're going to be... Um, Oh, I'm gonna be so annoying, and what? It, yeah, okay. I mean, you're going to have to communicate with people, but the idea is, nobody has a limit to the amount of awesome bands they can like. That's what I say. It's called abundance, right? Just because I like Sarah McLaughlin doesn't mean I can't like Sarah Bareilles. Right. You know, like if I hear awesome songs, like seriously, like there's no limit to how many I can like, right? No. That, 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 that's absolutely right. And that's the whole thing is that, oh, if you get a new message from a person who has a few songs that you like, okay, maybe I'll check it out later. Maybe I'll check it out now. But it, it's not like you're asking them for like some kind of long-term commitment. You're just asking them to maybe check out your next song or to read your email. It's, it's not an annoyance, especially if you believe in the kind of stuff you're creating. And I really think that if you don't believe in it, then go back to the drawing board and find something that you do believe in. You know, because in order to succeed, you're going to have to, you're going to have to love it. Yes. You know? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so, I mean, I like what you said there. So uh, an artist, when they're just starting out, one of the first things they should do, start developing their fan base, start finding personal ways to meet people, to talk to people. Messaging social media is personal in its own right. I mean, we all have people that we don't even know, but we know what they had for breakfast. <laughs> you know, we, we all have people that you're like, I don't even know who that guy is, but I, I, I know who we voted for. <laughs> um, so we have, we all have that kind of thing. It's like going through our heads all the time. And so if you can actually give some people something of value and something that they'll like, um, I don't know, it just can make their life better. Just, Absolutely. Just, just, just what I think. So, um, if people want to get involved in the, uh, profitable musicians summit, like where are some places they can go? What are the dates that it goes? And let's give them that format real quick so they kind of know what to expect of each day of that summit and if it's during the day or if they can come in after work and check it out. And it's okay if you have a day. Don't feel bad if you have a day job, everybody. I do. I'm talking to you from a day job right now. 
But that does not mean, <laughs> hey, that doesn't mean, I mean, Charles Bukowski wrote some crazy, became a famous poet, and he worked at the post office until he's almost dead. Um, you know, a lot of musicians, uh, you, you, you keep what you're working on, and, and, and you know, uh, you got you to gotta work um, so you can keep creating your music, because if you starve, you can't make. So, uh, so let's say people come home 5, 30, 6 o'clock from whatever they're doing, or maybe they work a late shift, they come home at 3 o'clock in the morning. How do they check out that summit uh, and, and log on and spend some time learning some stuff? Well, the important thing is to get signed up with your free ticket. And I know you have a link for that that you're going to post in the, in the comments. Um, and so you, you're going to get signed up. You're going to be getting emails letting you know every day you know, who's, who the speakers are, uh, like I said, we have four to five speakers per day. We kick off on the first with an opening party, which is going to be awesome. We're going to have giveaways. We're going to have a secret speaker. Um, it's going to be really fun. So you're going to want to start there at five. Let's see, it's eight p.m. Pacific. I'm sorry, eight p.m. Eastern, five p.m. Pacific to come on to our live opening party. And then after that, the next nine days. They're gonna, we're going to be releasing interviews. We release them in the morning, and you'll be able to get access to them for 48 hours. So it's four to five interviews, you know, probably a total of four hours a day of content. So, you know, you're going to prioritize the ones that you want to watch most. And then, like I said, you can always just get the all-access pass if you want to not have to worry about rushing and, and rushing through them and we're going to be providing also action plans to people that get the all access pass which is it's very very reasonably priced for what you're getting with all these um, interviews plus individual action plans for each one so and we'll have you know a special q a and stuff for the people with the all access pass so but if you want to just come for free totally cool like i said you can access on your computer or mobile We'll be giving you the links every day through email. Also, you can sign up when you get signed up for the summit. You can sign up for uh, messenger reminders. If you prefer to get reminders that way, then it'll send you links in there to go to the page for that day's interviews. And um, like I said, we'll have a private face group as well, Facebook group as well so we can discuss all the speakers and have them comment and that kind of thing. Um, so the important thing is to sign up for your free ticket and then you'll be in on the inside to getting all the information and like, don't wait until May, you know, May 1st to sign up. You may as well sign up now. Then you're on the list. You know, you've got your ticket. You don't have to worry about it. And you know what? I, number one. Okay. Everybody, it doesn't cost any money. Like, <laughs> I mean, you can pay if you want to go into later and you want to go back and you want to, uh, take your time and go through things. But first of all, the idea is you have access to all these people and interviews and all of that stuff for free. And these, a lot of these people that are talking at this conference were featured at, at our Between the Ways Festival in Madison, uh, the btwmadison.com. And Between the Waves, um, I mean, people paid over 100 bucks to get in last year. Uh, Broad Jam Primo members, However, you know, they can come to Madison and, and, you know, they can come on in free. But a lot of people paid good money to check out the content of what these speakers are talking about. And so it's totally worth your time to listen and, and start learning this stuff because the more you know, the more powerful a uh, business person, uh, entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it, aligned with, you know, your musicianship, the more powerful you're going to be. And... And I'm speaking as an artist here, not just somebody that wants you to do well because of Broad Jam and because it always makes Broad Jam look good and Broad Jam artists do well. I, As an artist, I want you to do well, and I'll tell you why. Because as an artist, when I perform with artists who care, the show's going to be a thousand times better. When you perform with a band that promotes, with an artist that tells people about the show and does invitations and works on posters, like, Brie, I mean... You know, when you work with people who care about what they're doing, what what's the difference between that and then you having to put in all the work? Oh, it's huge. It's huge because, you know, divide, like you can divide and conquer and you can also work to people's strengths. Like I can't be good at everything. So, right. you know. So so just make sure. And the, and the, and the fact is um, they are literally giving it away. 
So that's why, I mean, I don't, I don't feel bad about saying go sign up. Like, click that link and sign up. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? You get smarter? Yeah, sucks. So, <laughs> so make sure you guys go do that. Um, and we're really proud uh, that we can help promote this kind of thing and help make your music better and help you guys learn stuff and help you promote better and be more successful. Um, you know, just to close out, Bree, do you have any like, closing thoughts or anything or um, – any last kind of things you want to say to Broadjet members, like stop sending me your, you know, stop sending me the <laughs> you know, Anything in particular, uh, any kind of closing out messages you might want to say to Broadjet members, um, because for the people who aren't watching this live, we'll be able to watch the replay uh, this week, and you, you might be watching this. Not a snowstorm in Wisconsin when it's warm. Um, and then, will that, won't that be the best for everybody? So, uh, you know, just any, any, parting, any parting words of wisdom. Uh, from sunny California. Oh man. I mean, I made this for you guys. So take advantage of it. That's, I was, I had you in mind every second of every interview, you know, with all the, I thought very deeply about what questions I was going to ask. And, you know, Steve and I, my partner, we're very focused on making sure that it's very practical advice. It's not just like, you know, woo woo advice, or it's not just, kind of um, vague, you know, we're giving you very specific advice on what to do if you want to incorporate this stream of income. This is how you go about it. And I go through with each of the speakers, like, th this is how they got to where they are now. So you can just follow their trajectory. So, I mean, I would just say, like, when you get this opportunity, take advantage of it, because that's what I want you to do. I, I just created it for you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, I got to say, thank you very much for spending uh, your your Wednesday uh, evening with us, Bree. And uh, good luck with the uh, Profitable Musician Summit. We are going to be talking about it on Broad Jam over the next few weeks. And if you guys, if you're not watching this on Facebook and maybe put it on YouTube in the future, uh, the link is down is, is down in the comments. You'll be able to find it there. Otherwise, if you came here from a Broad Jam email, um, you'll be able to find the link in that original email. You'll be able to sign up for the summit, come on in, uh, start watching some of the videos, and then learn a little bit. And it, it's going to help your Broad Jam submissions and the promotion of your work and all that kind of stuff. And that's something that, that means a lot to all of us because we want you to succeed. And the more – come on. And G.I. Joe told us knowing is half the battle. Thank you very much <laughs> for your time tonight, Bree. You are welcome. Thank you for letting me talk about all of this stuff. Awesome. It's been great. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, and for okay. you Broad Jam members out there, uh, this is Mike uh, this Huberty, is and I am the Artist Services Manager at Broad Jam. When you guys have questions uh, about some, anything that goes on at Broad Jam in the uh, music licensing or contests or have uh, you have ideas or anything like that, feel free to send me an email, mike at broadjam.com. Uh, we're happy to answer all the questions to the best of our ability. Make sure you check out the Profitable Musician Summit uh, in the first, the, the, you know, first 10 days of May. It's going to be something you're going to learn a lot and uh, it's going to help you with your career. So if, if you have any questions, go ahead. If you see this later, uh, you can put something in the comments. We'll see it. Otherwise, Mike at broadjam.com and hope everybody has an awesome week. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm Mike. That was Bree. And you guys keep Bye. making music. <laughs>